Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Tonight, we've got an early impression or a late night insight or a quick hit video, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I did go for a three mile run uh, and so I am uh, exhausted, but I want to talk perfume because I've been wearing this um, little sample of Terre de Hermes for maybe like four or five nights. You know, I've got to wear it over the last couple weeks and really dive into it. And I've smelled Terre, Terre de Hermes EDT. This is the EDT from 2006, done by Jean-Claude Elena before. But um, I've never had a chance to like wear it back to back to back and really kind of, uh, you know, dive into it. And so I wanted to do this video. Uh, there's a million reviews of Terre de Hermes. So this is going to be a drop in the ocean. But there's some things that I kind of thought about while I was testing the scent that I want to discuss. And maybe it'll make you think about the scent a little bit different and make you think about uh, how the bigger picture of perfume and perfumers can play into a creation like this. So um, the very first thing I want to talk about, actually I'm going to reach back and grab my Eau de Hermes uh, box because there's something, there's something in the opening that uh, I pick up that I hardly hear anyone talk about. No one talks about this. And it's very quick. It's almost like if you're not paying attention, you'll miss it. If you blink, you'll miss it. It's that kind of vibe. So when you first spray, uh, what's very interesting about Terre de Hermes to me is that even though everyone thinks of this as, you know, Hermes's modern release, it's like a modern perfume. And it is, it's a very modern perfume, but Jean-Claude Elena left clues, you know, it's, 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 he's leaving breadcrumbs to find his way back, if you will. And the very first thing, when you very first spray this fragrance, and I mean literally seconds and it's gone, is there is a slight hit of cumin to me. Uh, and it's very small. It's the smallest dose of cumin that I've ever picked up. Um, and then it's gone. So he did Cartier's declaration in the 90s as a love letter to this, Eau de Hermes, which Edmund Rudnitska, who created Eau de Hermes in 1951, was, is, is considered by many to be the greatest perfumer of all time. And um, he trained two people, Pierre Bourdon, whose name will come up later in the video, and Jean-Claude Elena. He also trained his son, Michel Rudnitska, um, but the two perfumers who are not family, the two that got the um, tutelage were Pierre Bourdon and Jean-Claude Elena. And Jean-Claude Elena has, um, he kind of got the lesser of the tutelage, if you will. Pierre Bourdon was like the hands-on, he was there every day. Jean-Claude Elena got the, you know, tutelage from far away, if you will. He got letters now and then from Edmund Rudnitska, stuff like that. Um, and so he didn't, uh, he didn't get the full-on immersed, you know, schooling that Pierre Bourdon got from uh, Edmund Runitska. And so I really think he took what Edmund Runitska said to heart, deeply to heart. And you can see how much Eau de Hermes and actually Edmund Runitska's use of cumin um, in fragrances or that type of spice, uh, you know, that spicy opening, the way that Edmund Rudnitska loved to use the cumin in the opening, uh, but also keep it within the confines of a uh, classic structure, really affected Jean-Claude Elena. Like, for example, I have it right here still. My scent of the day was an Edmund Rudnitska. Actually, it was Rochas Femme. Um, parfum, pure parfum. And it is beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Uh, the cumin in this is even more in the opening than the Parfum de Toilette. I think I like the Parfum de Toilette a little bit more. There's this strange turmeric vibe that I get from the Pure Parfum. Um, and I don't get that from the Parfum de Toilette. But I just mention that because Edmund Rudnitska was known for his love of the cumin note. And if you look at his creations over and over and over and over again, you see that. You see it with Eau de Hermes. You see it with Rochas Femme. You even see it with Eau Sauvage, which many people think of as this fresh, heady own, you know, ethereal type scent. Um, 
and it was seen as like a new kind of freshness at the time. And what's interesting is that even there, there's a cumin note. Now, in the modern stuff, you won't pick it up. I don't have a very old bottle. I think my bottle's like from 20, 2003 is my guess. Uh, but even my bottle, it's very turned down. I would love to smell an Eau de Hermes from the 60s. I'm sorry, uh, Eau Sauvage from, from the 60s or 70s because I bet you there was a big cumin note in it. So my point in saying all that is that I think that Jean-Claude Elena took his tutelage really to heart. You know, he really wanted to take that idea and run with it, if you will. And he knew that if he added too much, it, it wouldn't be the hit that it could be. And so I think that he really toned it down. But if you pay attention, you'll get that slight reminder almost like a very slight recognition, you know, like a thank you from far away, from 2006. Edmund Rudnitska was long gone. He was long dead. Um, and that's very interesting because there's other little strange details that I pick up in Ter de Hermes um, that I hear no one talk about. So this video on Ter is going to be probably a little different than you know, um, what most people would talk about when it comes to Terre de Hermes EDT. Now, I do have experience with the scent because I do own the Parfum. I own the Parfum. And the Parfum is heavier. Uh, it is, you know, it's tear, but uh, just straight to the point. And what's interesting is, is that he didn't do an, he didn't go eau de toilette, eau de parfum, parfum. He went eau de toilette in 2006. Parfum in 2009. So just a couple years later, he went pure parfum, um, which tells you something maybe about the structure of Terre that he just straight skipped the regular eau de parfum. Um, and so Terre is basically uh, described as this woody, earthy, orange scent, okay? And um, when you first spray, the other thing that you won't see if you just go read a note listing is it's gone now because this has been on my skin for about an hour already. But um, when you first spray, you're hit with what smells to me like Petit Gras and Orange Blossom. And the Orange Blossom makes sense to me because um, everyone talks about the orange note or the orange accord in tear. And it is a big part of it. Um, I've even heard Terre de Hermes described as like an orange fragrance that doesn't smell like an orange, if that makes sense. It's an orange fragrance that doesn't smell like an orange. Um, but orange blossoms, uh, if you, if you remember, they literally, if you find an orange tree, you'll see orange blossoms, you'll see oranges. The orange blossoms are literally what turns into the orange itself. So it makes sense that, um, the orange blossom would easily lead you into that orange smell. No one talks about that orange blossom accord. Again, it's very early and it's very fast. So Tear is a fragrance that in the early stages moves a lot, but you have to pay attention. And the other thing is it's hidden under this absolute, um, you know, bucket of ISO E Super. This is, this is, probably over 50% ISO E Super, if I had to guess. I have no idea. I'm not a perfumer. It's just my guess. It just feels like it's just loaded with ISO E Super. And, um, and I think that really helped the popularity of it because it seems um, very modern. And this came out in 2006. And it's a fragrance that kind of feels like it goes away and it comes back. And you maybe won't smell it, but the people around you will definitely smell that ISO E Super. Um, and, of course, it has that grapefruit opening. So you get the grapefruit, you get the orange, uh, and I think you get the orange blossom with just a little bit of Petit Gras. And it just leads into that earthy woodiness. The orange, the orange itself feels very earthy and very woody, like you took an orange and buried it. Uh, and I think the reason that it has that feel to it is it, this fragrance has uh, a, an amazing vetiver note. Again, not many people talk about the, uh, the vetiver, but the brilliance of this fragrance to me is how it can incorporate so many bits and pieces from all of these other fragrances 
that are kind of like cult classics. I mentioned Oda Hermes with the cumin bit in the opening, and it's very, again, it's very small, um, but I can smell it quickly, and then it's gone. Uh, and the other thing that I noticed is Terra de Hermes has this flintstone note, or this flint note, if you will. Um, and the flint note is what's taken me like a week to keep on wearing this, to continue to want to dive into that note a little bit more, because it's very, very interesting to me, because flint, uh, I think, can smell very metallic. Um, and the, the part that really kind of led me on this tangent when I wanted to talk about tear is that, um, you have the, the teacher, right? With, with Edmund Rudnitska, but you also have, um, there are bits and pieces from, uh, his co-classmate, Pierre Bourdon. And what I started to think about when I started to see connections is tear came out in 2006 in 2002, Pierre Bourdon released this. Well, Creed released this, but it's a Pierre Bourdon. Uh, and interestingly enough, they talk about this fragrance. Uh, it's Himalaya, by the way, from 2002. And this is the only 100 ml bottle of Creed that I own. Never again. N absolutely never again will I buy 100 ml. I had the... Um, I had the 4 point... Uh, the 4 ounce of this, the 120 mil of this, the old school, probably like a 10 year old bottle. Um, and what a difference in smell. I mean, the quality is, has fallen off so bad with Creed. I'll never buy a new Creed, but, um, the, um, the musk in this is still really pretty. It's awesome in the base. It's, I will say that they are still using, I think a good quality musk, but for some reason, the first hour or two feels like it lost all of its shine and, 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 uh, luster, but I won't, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole today. What I do want to talk about with this fragrance, um, Himalaya is Himalaya uses grapefruit and orange in the opening. Uh, and it uses pepperiness, which there's a bunch of pepper and tear, black and pink pepper. And it's definitely, you can smell that pepperiness. It's a very important part of the composition. With Himalaya, it's pink pepper and black pepper as well. With grapefruit and mandarin orange. There is a gunpowder accord here. And this fragrance comes up in the Ghost Perfumer book because... I think it was Maurice Roger, Roger um, who was running Dior at the time in the 90s when uh, Pierre Bourdon created his first Dior. And that was a lifelong dream. Um, Dolce Vita, I think is what it was called. Dolce Vita is what, what Pierre Bourdon's Dior, Dior was called. And they had this idea to use this gunpowder accord in the 90s. Maurice Ra Roger, I think it was Roger, I could be wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, if someone knows, but um, long story short is his health wasn't very good, and Maurice Roger had to step down, the fragrance never got released from Dior, he wanted it to, um, but it never did, and so it ended up in the slimy clutches of um, Olivier Creed, who made it Himalaya, but what's interesting about that is the gunpowder accord. The gunpowder accord with the grapefruit, mandarin orange, and pepperiness. What's also interesting about this is this is not the only gunpowder accord that Pierre Bourdon used around the same time. There was a fragrance two years later. So this is four years before Terre de Hermes. This is two years before Terre de Hermes, and it's called Full Choke. Now, Full Choke um, is a fragrance by the house of Francesco Smalto, who has a couple fragrances I really, really like. Um, Smalto Pour Homme is one of them, and um, Malto Smalto is another. Both of those are brilliant. Uh, this is a fragrance that I will do a video on very soon. This is thanks to Rich Mitch. He sent me this sample. Uh, probably one of the uh, worst bottles you'll ever see. It looks like a dildo. And the designer who designed it actually said it was modeled after a dildo. That's what it was supposed to be. Go look up the full, and then it's named Full Choke. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, it almost feels like Pierre Bourdon was the butt of a bad joke. But 
The fragrance itself is good. And what's interesting about Full Choke, many things are interesting about it. One is the pineapple accord. So this is six years before Aventus, and Pierre Bourdon is already playing with that pineapple accord, which Jean-Christophe Herault will eventually use in Aventus, okay? So Pierre Bourdon's already playing with that pineapple accord, and it's in many fragrances, it's not just Full Choke. There are many Pierre Bourdon fragrances that have that pineapple accord. Um, and so to me, I mean, Pierre Bourdon, I think deserves credit for, a, some credit for Aventus, even though he didn't create it, he very much influenced, uh, Jean-Christophe Herot, I think, because Pierre Bourdon was his teacher, his master. But, um, getting off of the pineapple accord, there's a gunpowder note in here and there's a Vietnamese white pepper. Okay. So it's, um... Uh, gunpowder, Vietnamese white pepper, with a base of Java vetiver, okay? So, um, this is two years before tear. Now, I'm not bringing this up to um, bash tear in any way, or, or say that tear, you know, was a copy or anything. I'm not saying that at all, because um, this fragrance did something that I think Her Hermes uh, dreaded for many years. Remember, Hermes is the house that is um, so elite, so elitist, so bourgeois, so up, up, upper class that you could walk into a Hermes boutique with a hundred thousand dollars or a hundred grand on your credit card limit and say, I want to buy a Birkin bag. And they would say, no, you literally have to go buy. They would say, go buy some gloves, go buy some socks, go buy some you know, go buy a horse saddle, go buy uh, new Hermes shoes, go buy, they want you to buy all this other stuff and build up almost like accolades, almost like try to reach the final boss in a game. And then once you've spent half a million dollars or whatever it is, then they'll sell you the hundred, the hundred, two hundred thousand dollar Birkin bag, whatever it is. Um, and that's the level of elite status that Hermes sees itself as they try to they try to um, control who can you can't just walk in there with money and buy the the bag you have to you have to be a known member to the staff that kind of thing right the reason I bring all that up is because Hermes's fragrances before Tear de Hermes um, they did something uh, that, you know to people like me like Bella Me is my favorite fragrance of all time. Um, they have some absolute hits. Equipage, I've really grown. It's grown on me. At first I said, I don't know about Equipage, but I've worn it more and more and it's it's continued to grow on me. Even though that opening is tough, uh, I do like what it dries down to. Um, and things like Roca Bar, I love Roca Bar. You know, they've had some amazing hits, but they never had a blowout hit for the masses. You know, they always assumed like with the original Hermes. This is the original Hermes fragrance, for those of you that don't know, Eau de Hermes. The idea was they were going to give it away to people who bought the Birkin bags or Kelly bags or whatever it is. Um, they were going to give it away. And when your bag stopped smelling, having that new bag smell, you would take Eau de Hermes, spray it inside of the bag, and it was supposed to have that leathery, smell that the inside of the of a Birkin bag had um you know when it was brand new that was the idea they were shocked people would even pay for it um they didn't think customers would pay money for an Hermes perfume they weren't Dior you know or or um they weren't Rochas or or whatever Guerlain and so, but people started demanding it. They started demanding that they sell them this fragrance. And so that's kind of how it got started uh, with Eau de Hermes. But it was always for the elite. It was always for the people that went into the store to spend big money. Uh, it was never for the masses. Tear um, really busted Hermes out of that. It brought them to another level as far as popularity. You know, high school kids were wearing Terre de Hermes. Um, people were going into Hermes boutiques specifically to buy a $100 perfume, not a $10,000 bag or whatever it may be. 
pair of gloves or driving gloves or whatever leather goods Hermes sells. I'm not into the fashion side. As you can see, I have an undershirt on. Um, but my point in saying all that is that with this creation, Jean-Claude Elena struck gold. I mean, he literally, uh, uh, even when he was asked about it, he says, Terre de Hermes is still a mystery to me. He said that about Terre de Hermes. Um, and so it's a, it's, it's, it's an interesting example. And if you go back to that Flint note, which is such a important note, um, the, uh, Flint note. So if you look at just Flint itself, you know, Flint has been used in human history since prehistoric times. If you take a thing of Flint and hit it on a rock, an iron heavy rock, I, sh I should say it'll, it, you could start a fire with it. Um, and they were, they were used in the very first, um, uh, they were used in the very first firearms during the Napoleonic era. And, um, Flint can give off this metallic, almost like you're smelling submerged metal. Like you take a piece of metal, submerge it in water and, um, that's what it can, that's what it can smell like. Or even the steel like vibe. Um, and it's, um, the connection between full choke and Himalaya and the fact that Pierre Bourdon was a, uh, disciple of Edmund Rudnitska. So you can see all these little pieces in tear is what's interesting. So tear manages to do something that is almost impossible. It manages to be popular for the, um, average person who isn't a perfumista uh, or a fume head, you know, someone who buys one bottle a year and they wear that bottle until it's gone and then they go buy another bottle, sometimes of the exact same thing, sometimes something different. But <clears throat> this fragrance was that one bottle for many people uh, over the last 15 years or whatever it is. Um, and to be able to do that, to have that level of popularity, I mean, it it's even 15 years later, um, the EDT, according to Parfumo, is in the top 50 of men's fragrances, of all men's fragrances. Um, and that's a very tough thing to do. Longevity, number one, is amazing. Popularity was amazing. But the other thing is, look at the depth that I just went into going through the timeline of Pierre, of Jean-Claude Elena's fellow classmate, fellow disciple of Pierre, of uh, Edmund Rudnitska, that, uh, with all the little details in here, it's very hard to be both a intellectual perfume and uh, just a mass hit. To be able to have both ideas, you know, in your mind, um, to, to complete both tasks is very tough. And um, the last thing I want to say is that uh, there was a perfume that came out by Bertrand Duchafour. And Bertrand Duchafour made many things for the house of uh, L'Artisan Parfumer. And uh, one of them, one of my favorite L'Artisans, is called Timbuktu. And Timbuktu is from 2004. This is a newer bottle uh, after Puig bought them. I actually have an older bottle too. Uh, I like them both. The older bottle I think is is deeper. This has lost a, a little bit of depth, I think. But uh, it's still good. It is still good. Um, and it's also spicy and woody. Uh, but the reason I bring it up is that um, the vetiver in the base, the vetiver and the huge amounts of ISOE Super, which I think are also, um, I think there, I think also there are uh, Vetiver and ISOE, and I think this, which was only two years before Tear, I think Jean-Claude Elena took notes, okay, is what I'm saying. I think he took notes from Pierre Bourdon. I think he took notes from people who he, uh, respected. He respected uh, Bertrand Duchafour. 
and I think he definitely respected his fellow classmate, Pierre Bourdon, who was the only man basically better than him uh, to get full classes from Edmund Rudnitska. Um, and then I think he gave just a slight nod to Oda Hermes in the opening, and he created something amazing. Will I buy a bottle of this? No, I won't. Uh, although it is full bottle worthy, the problem that I have is that I have this, and uh, I have Roja's Oligarch, which basically is Terre de Hermes um, with um, some additions, some Roja additions. You know, he I keep I keep using the term he Roja it up, right? And he did. He took Terre and he Roja it up. Uh, he added some fruits and made it more of a chifra and stuff like that. But it's still at heart to me smells enough like tear where I wouldn't go drop a bottle on tear de Hermes. Um, but you never know. I mean, if the right deal comes along, I've been eyeing those 500 mil bottles. If I can get one of those for 250 bucks, I would love one of those 500 mil bottles. Those things are awesome. I mean, you could just douse yourself in tear. Not that you need to. But um, sometimes I just enjoy doing that. Just spraying away with reckless abandon, you know. Um, the last thing is that the patchouli and the benzoin add a little bit of base, you know, so even though this is, I would consider this a summer fragrance, I would wear this in the summer, you could wear this anytime, but if I was going to wear this, I would wear this in the summer. Um, because the, even though it has some patchouli and benzoin, it's there for heft, because otherwise this, this to me, um is is a perfect summer fragrance because it comes and goes you can smell it and but you can't you know you're not gonna um you're not gonna smell it eight hours later but people around you will smell you eight hours later it's that kind of fragrance and um if you want to get into intellectual perfume mode this works if you want to get into just throw something on and go out the door and still smell good it works uh i think it's um I think the EDT is, is um, you know, probably the one that highlights the, um, it highlights the magnificent balance that Ter gives you. You know, Jean-Claude Elena was known as this recluse who lived out in the, I mean, he would literally go live by himself in the forest, just him and his assistant. And they would, he would go out there and just make fragrances uh, as a recluse, basically, uh, solo, you know? Um, and Tear, Tear to me feels like he just struck gold. Like he just, he just, he was in this Zen like moment. He, he took notes from people he trusted and then he created something amazing. But since I have the Parfum and I know it's heavier, I would still wear this in summer. I would, I just, I just wouldn't care. You know, I heard someone say, uh, that you would have to be an asshole to wear this in summer. Well, I, I'll be the asshole. I'll wear the Parfum in summer. Um, the Parfum, interestingly enough, has a... Um, the Parfum has a Shisu note, I believe. Um, Tear, let's see. Let me look it up real quick. 2009 was the Parfum. Yeah, it has a Shiso note. Um... And benzoin, grapefruit, and that cedar wood is what's listed. Woody, earthy, but it's much more, um, it's heavier. You know, it, it lasts a little bit longer. Yeah, it's it's a little bit more, the parfum is, is feels like it's a little bit more full, you know, that kind of thing. It's got some richness to it. And uh, so since I have this oligarch, and I see a connection to tear, since I have the parfum, I um, I think I would I would skip buying a full bottle of the EDT, but it is full bottle worthy, and I hope I've stimulated some of your brain cells here in thinking about tear maybe a little bit differently because, uh, you know it it's a video I've been wanting to do for a while. I've been testing this for a while, um, but I wanted to make sure I really understood it before I did the video. And um, it's it's worthy of it's worthy of that. I think it's earned that that right for me to take my time with this. And um, 
I hope you guys think I did a good job or at least made you think a little bit differently about Terre and how it was created and maybe a little bit of Jean-Claude Elena's thought process. Obviously, he doesn't call me and tell me. I'm just guessing some of these things. I'm trying to put the pieces of the puzzle together. But um, let me know what your experiences are with Terre EDT. Uh, and uh, I really appreciate everyone's support, feedback, you know, subscriptions, comments, all that good stuff. I love it. I love seeing your faces in the comments. I love responding to the comments. Um, I love doing these videos for you guys. So I hope you guys appreciate it. Cheers, and I look forward to talking to you again tomorrow. Bye, guys.